Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Before we introduce this week's guest, I want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters. Patreon's a great way to support everything Cool Tools does, including our newsletters, podcast, video channel, and our flagship review website. This week, we want to give a shout out to Bruce Bear, Dan Dow, and Sean Levin. Thanks a lot to all three of you. If you would like to become a patron of Cool Tools, please visit patreon.com slash cool tools. Our guest this week is Dr. Brian Fisher. He's a curator of entomology at the California Academy of Sciences and a world-renowned ant expert. Nicknamed the Ant Man, Fisher has spent three decades documenting the island of Madagascar's beautiful biodiversity. Along the way, he's discovered over 1,000 new ant species. That is incredible. As he witnessed the biodiversity crisis unfold in Madagascar, Fisher began applying traditional insect eating practices to reduce bushmeat consumption, sustain forest, and improve nutrition of children. Hi, Brian. How are you? Greetings. Great to be here. Oh, it's so wonderful to hear your voice, Brian, and so glad that you can join us and share with us some of your favorite tools and maybe some of your experiences in traveling around the world and seeing what there are available in terms of insects. I look forward to sharing with you uh, any secrets I have into the world of <laughs> yes. tools. Excellent. Okay. I imagine you have lots of them that you use both in your own work and also as a expedition-like traveler. So, so we're looking forward to them. So, so the tools you're going to talk about this time are all kind of related to the world of ant collecting, which I think is really cool. So, let's just start with the shovel. You have a you have a shovel that you wanted to tell us about, right? So, I first I have to kind of set the scene as. Um, what is an ant collector? Um, it seems like a sim simple concept, right? You go out and you collect an ant. They should be everywhere. But as it turns out, the interesting ones are really hard to find. In fact, most habitats offer you this incredible, vast three-dimensional space. Think of the canopy and also think of the soil. And you're trying to find a very tiny insect, an ant in that habitat. And it's really a gamble if that branch you break, you're going to find an ant. If that stone you turn over, you're going to find an ant. And you have to actually put a lot of effort into it. And often, though, when you're collecting, you're alone. And there's nothing about like being alone to really make you rely on tools because you just get a really close kind of connection to them. And there are there's one thing I never leave for the tropics without this shovel. And you may think a shovel is a shovel, but it's not. This shovel is lightweight, so I, and it fits exactly in a bag that you can get on an airplane. And it's made of airplane aluminum. It's got this razor sharp edges that cuts roots so that you can dig. And you can operate it basically with one hand or you can jump on it like crazy and it won't break. I've had the same shovel for like, I don't know, 20 years now. Wow. Does it fold up or collapse the, no, the no. handle? No, no, no. You, you may see, you were like me. You were tempted by those <laughs> fold up shovels, right? You fold them up, you put them in your backpack. Yeah. So convenient, right? No. But they way. don't do anything. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be on that mountain that took you 10 days to get up and that shovel is going to fail you just when you be, could be collecting a new genus of ant. Don't, <laughs> don't fall for it. Okay. So this, so it's like a solid, never bust, uh, rigid, lightweight um, shovel. So who, who are the shovel experts? And as an ant collector, either you invent your tool or you find another community that's one up to you on on what they need. And as it turns out, the community, um, I'm kind of forgetting the, the name for this community, but they're basically looking for things that are lost in the soil. You know, the, there was ones with the little oh, yeah, like, little the, uh, the treasure finders. Yes, but little, they have a name um, for them. You know, yeah. they have this like a little magnetic thing. Yeah, and, yeah, beep, yeah. Beep, 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 and they start digging. 
Well, they figured out how to dig quickly because mostly they're digging in places that they have to do it really quick because it's probably illegal to dig there. <laughs> and they got the right tools. And that whole community, and thanks to, I guess back then it was eBay, where you could actually buy it. And people started making these in their garages. And oh, okay. just like one company called Predator um, that makes really useful tools. And I, it has because I'm a, I travel internationally and it's got to fit in a luggage and it's and it's got to last. In this thing, you don't have to worry about it, except that it's super sharp. And I had to invent a little kind of like a, a sheath for it so that when we are traveling and porters are carrying it in, it doesn't kind of go through the rice sack and cut somebody. Wow. Wow. Okay. So that's really cool. Okay. All right. So if you, for the, I, I, it's not just for digging ant holes, it's for uncovering buried treasure. And if you're camping or you need to set up some trench around your tent or something, that's what you'd want to use for, for, this for. And as it turns out, it's great for digging out, you know, car tires and stuff like that too. <laughs> yes. Okay. And did we mention it, the price? It's a hundred dollars. Okay. Oh, it's gone up, but it's still a deal. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. great. Looks very well made. Yeah, so what, it does. what's next on your list? Brian? You, so you have a, you have a um, a magnifier as as well. Tell us about that. Right. So this is another piece of a you know a tool um, that is on my body twenty four hours a day throughout the second I leave my you know house to go to the airplane. It's on me, and I never take it off at all. And it's it, it's a jeweler's. Uh, High grade, 20 excellence and finding a 20 X, that means it magnifies it 20 times, um, is really hard to find. But at 20 X, it's like a mini microscope and you can identify an ant, almost a species in the field using this uh, high quality lens. So so what you just said is, is to me pretty profound. You're saying 20 X is close to maybe what a microscope would give you and and it's not a it's a little tiny um i don't know but the size of your thumb almost maybe a little bit bigger it's a tiny tiny little magnifying glass that will give you almost as much power as like say a low powered microscope might right it's in a hand lens for lots of reasons and once again i have to kind of set up the scenario when it's being used so let's say you're in the shovel you dug this hole and after a while, you know, half your body is in this hole. So imagine yourself with your feet sticking out, your body's in the hole. And you also dig with a headlamp because you have to see. So you're digging and then you, you just, you have a millisecond of a chance to see this ant before it kind of disappears again into the matrix of the soil. You grab it with another tool you might want to talk about, but you have to see if it's something interesting. Discovery science is not blind. The more information you can bring to the situation, the more powerful and more reactive your, your decisions can be made. So you want to know, is it new or not? And I can figure that out with the hand lens. And that hand lens is basically the only thing that does it. When you're in there in the dirt, you can't open up a microscope. This thing's around your neck. That means it's always right there so that your hands can get to it, even though you're in a compromised position. And you can move it up there. And if you can push down your headlamp so you can actually get light. Now with these 20X lenses, you have no field of vision. In fact, you're holding the hand lens and the specimen, you know, three eighths of an inch from your eye. So there's no wiggle room uh, and it's hard to get light to it, but you can, and that allows you to identify it. Um, most people when they have a hand lens, they only use a 10X because otherwise you have to kind of master the art of, looking at something if, if you weren't examining or trying to find these pieces of ants would the could you use this magnifier for like if you were interested in plants and botany would you um is there other like if you carry around all the time do you find yourself using it for other things besides ants? oh yes all the time like pulling out splinters <laughs> um <laughs> illness surgery uh, all those types of things it's it's a microscope it's a it's it's the best microscope and I've used the same brand since uh, 1988, I think. And it's the only one I could buy in the U.S. Now, I know there's another company in Belarus who also makes a 20X, um, but I've never tried it. Right. So this is this is the Bashan Lum. I, I don't know how you say that, but it's a very 
reputable optics company forever, and it's a 20x, and it's forty dollars basically. Don't don't. Uh, also, they make a cheap version, uh, one glass. This is um, uh, this is a triplet magnifier. That's yeah, what you so want. it's three glasses. It's like a camera lens. Okay, so you want the triplet lens? Yes, and it's and so tiny. It's so tiny. Yes, it's I mean, it's like you could put it on your keychain. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it, it won't help you. It's it's like the only place that's available to you if you're climbing a tree, and you and. It's just magic that it fits around your neck, and that's exactly often the only place that you can actually reach and get it get it up to your eye. Uh huh. Okay. Twenty X. Yes, yeah, I see the ten X, and there's a fourteen X, but the magic is going to happen with the twenty X. Yeah, the other ones don't. I don't mean bother with the other ones. Okay, that's cool. So I, I see on your list, you. Uh, I, I know you have a couple of specialized ant ones. Maybe we'll get to those, but you also have. The Alaskan Mill, which in, to my understanding is a chainsaw mill for making lumber. Yes, that was my list for like what I have been loving at home. So that's not. So are collector. you are you are you building a house or or what? What, what? what are you doing with Alaskan Mill, and why is Alaskan Mill better than something else? Well, it's I'm. I'm it's an interesting concept, you know, and as a, it's just amazing as a human, you can keep learning your entire life, right? And, and that's so fun about tools is that tools can really open a whole new world for you. And, and nothing better than a, a chainsaw with an adapter called the Alaskan mill. You know, it just sits there, right? It just sits there. And that's what's cool about a tool until you pick it up and you can do things with it. Now, I, I, live in uh, our family we live in a very kind of weird house up in uh the, our redwoods it used to be a campground it's on a very steep hill it's about 40 degree slope um it's in the redwoods there's no sunlight and i've been trying to build on this house for the, since since i got it 20 years ago and it's 450 square feet and we're trying to make it bigger and since you can't really carry stuff up to the house very easily and we had to expand a little bit. We actually removed three large redwood trees that were touching our house and actually causing trouble. So I've been building on our house using the redwood trees on a slope. Now, this is a lot of wood, three large redwood trees. Now, normally you would get a, a miser saw and set up a mill and do that, but you can't when you live on a slope. In fact, the only tool you can really use to change this tree into buildable lumber is the Alaskan mill. It's where you get a giant chainsaw, you know, so all of a sudden here I am, you know, buying a giant professional chainsaw and, you know, every weekend I'm milling wood in the back of the house with a chainsaw. Um, so describe the Alaskan chainsaw. It's, it's a contraption that kind of guides the chainsaw on a very level path um, in, uh, uh, as you kind of take layers of the log off one by one. Right. You can set what that thickness will be. So you're cutting slices through a log and you could be like, you just want regular two by fours. But, you know, we use two by fours, for example, because that's what we buy at the store. But with a Alaskan mill, you can invent your own unique wood and you can make uh, everything you want, your size. Three by threes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Anything. Eight by threes, eight by fours. You can do anything you want to. And it's great. It's very empowering. And I I really liked it because I felt like this house deserved to have its wood that, that was grown here um, over the last hundred years. Um, and also because when I had lived in Peru uh, a good long, I think it was 92, no, no, before that, 1990, I built all the stuff where I lived and, and like just building a table, you don't go to Ikea and just buy a table. You have to build a table and that takes forever. You got to cut the tree down. You got to cut the wood. You got to sand the wood. It takes forever. So the actual part of putting the table together was a small fraction of the actual whole process. And, but it was very satisfying. So what I'm doing here is also satisfying, but the, I can say that, the beauty of the tool is what attracted me the most. It works. It just works beautifully. Now, there's a lot of other things you need for that. You know, I live on a slope and I didn't realize that I would have to rely on wrenches more than anything else to, to handle the log and have like this three-dimensional 
webbing system to support the log so they don't roll down the hill. If one log gets away from me, it's, it might kill somebody or, or go through the house and take the house with it. Have you heard of, um, I think it's called a griffer? Um, it's a kind of a winch that allows you to winch things not with a ratchet kind of a winch, which is like more of um, steps, but you can actually um, winch things in like micro millimeters if you wanted to. And it was used originally f- for hoisting, th- um, like scaffolding up a side of a building because it's um, fail safe and it, and it works with kind of like little internal hands. Um, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the name, but does, does this ring a bell? No. Um, but what it allows people who are like, uh, who are winching, like um, erecting like towers where you want to be able to have very precise control of it and yet very, very strong, you know, um, tonnage or torque or whatever. Um, and so this was a tool that George Dyson um, discovered and turned me on to. But I'm not remembering the actual name of it, even though it was in Cool Tools. Um, I have to look that up. Okay. Um, um, but to be honest, I have a, I have a very uh, interesting story with winches because if you go online and look, most people buy these $50 hand winches, right? And I don't know if you've seen those or a lot of these aluminum or steel. And I, and I, I started going through those like a day, one a day, uh, they would just break. And there's, as it turns out, there's an American company that makes the best winch. And I have used that. And basically it's saved, it's, it's saved my, my life probably because these winches are so secure. Um, and under super tension, you can let them, you can release the pressure. So, um, Brian, one of the things that I know about you is that you're kind of like a modern Indiana Jones going on expeditions into the really wilderness areas, and if not wilderness, at least very remote places. What, what kind of things do you pack in when you when you're going out um, on the field for your own survivability or your own comfort? Do, do you does your luggage look any different than my luggage? Uh, probably, um, because I, I do this routine almost three times a month. Where you know, and I've been doing it for thirty years. What is a routine? It's a routine, and it also means that every possible problem has happened. Where the equipment, you know, I don't have what I need, so it's simplified. So I think one of the things you learned is really what do you need, and there's. And because safety is important, I've always invested in communication. A lot of people, you could spend a lot of effort investing in having something for every possible scenario that may happen to you. But I've found that the most important is to have communication. So I always carry a satellite phone with me. And if there's, besides a camera, that's the only really, you know, kind of high maintenance item I'm carrying into the field with me. And all the rest, what you carry with you, I think, is the things that will allow you to do your job. So I have my ant collecting stuff. And then to come back out. So that's the come back out alive. Uh, and that's the communication. <laughs> that's kind of important. Yeah. What kind of tools do you have for coming back alive? Well, so as I said, that since we, you do, do you it have so like often, a first aid kit, do you carry a first aid kit? Well, that's this whole point. So what – is first aid. So I don't want to say like sound like I'm cavalier or not, but it's like you don't carry a first aid kit when you go to the office every day, do you? But so going on these trips is like for me going to the office. But you want to be prepared for a really bad thing what you can't fix. And over the years, um, the things that you can't fix in the field are the things you have to get out to get emergency help. And that's where you need communication to call in SOS or to, you know, when a war, war, I remember when a war broke out and we were in Central Africa Republic, we had to negotiate with some missionaries to get a plane over in Cameroon. We had to sneak out of uh, Central Africa Republic into Cameroon to jump on that plane. A lot of problems happened in that we were caught. Uh, anyway, we finally got onto the plane and got out, but, um, I couldn't have done that without the satellite phone, for example. 
And, and meanwhile, you know, I did have uh, an elephant worm, so I couldn't wear a shoe. So, but did I have like the nematode, the exact nematode treatment for that disease with me? No. So, you know, I, I ended up landing in Paris with a bare foot and a big swollen foot. It's like elephantitis because, you know, oh I, I didn't have the treatment with me. So you can't plan for everything, but you have to plan for the, to be able to get yourself out. And the other thing that happens over and over again, and, and I, I, I have looked at all the possible tools for this, and that is foot rot. Over and over again, the silly thing that kind of stops our missions is often our feet are rotting. Um, and that happens sometimes overnight. And um, is that because of there's red socks or moisture? Oh, I've researched all those socks, right? And basically, mm -hmm. if you're there for a while, um, certain areas of the lowland tropics, because your feet are wet and there's something in the soil, um, your feet begin to rot after a while. So you can't really wear shoes. Those locals who aren't wearing shoes do it for a reason, not that they don't have shoes, but because if you had a shoe, your foot would rot. So you have to train your feet almost to not wear shoes. And then if you do have foot rot, um, so far, um, if it's already to the point where like the sole of your foot is falling off, to, we've only found one thing to treat with you. And we do carry this with us now. And that is, limes and they're often available when you're when you're hiking in sometimes we'll pass some wait, wait, wait. Do, you, do you eat the limes or put the limes on your feet no you cut them put the limes in the fire until they're uh really hot and then somebody holds you down <laughs> and they squeeze and rub the lime the hot lime uh, juice on your rotting feet <laughs> yes <laughs> it's like having glass wow. rubbed into your your body <laughs> Okay. And oh even God. though I know how painful it's going to be, it's, uh, but, um, so let's say like our porters are coming the next day. Everybody's got to be ready to walk out. And here we are all with our rotten feet. And, um, we have to walk out the next day. If you do the treatment the day before you can walk the next day. Oh, it's amazing. Wow. wow. That's um, so great to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, the, the fact the fact that you get um, rotten feet is because you're wearing shoes in the certain areas is um, that is important to know. I mean, at least you could wear maybe sandals. Would, would sandals lower the risk of it because it's kind of more aired than wearing closed shoes? Yes, but there's also the problems with the, the sandals because of um, often where you're getting this, there's a little bit of grit in the soil, and that grit is going to get in between uh, the sandal straps and start rubbing on your skin. And once your skin opens up there, it's like the fungus just gets in faster. Uh, I see, it's really I see. weird. Okay. Um, so it's basically, you wear shoes if you're going to be, if it's going to be dangerous because your feet aren't tough enough at the moment, or you don't wear shoes at all. Right. So you mentioned satellite phone a couple of times. Do you have a preferred satellite phone that you use that's better than others? My understanding of satellite phones for a while was that they required a subscription to make them work. You just couldn't buy the phone. What, what's, do you have a recommendation these days about that? Well, it's changing rapidly right now. And, it, and it's, I'll tell you why it changes. So before there was only, um, let's say, let's take you back 15 years, you had to get an Iridium if you're working in Africa. So only company that had a network that could get you coverage in a lot of Africa and um, Madagascar. And they were the best. But then they stopped adding satellites and their satellites started failing. So then it was Emersat. So maybe ten, no, seven years ago, you had to get Emersat. And so I had, you know, you have to buy a new phone and get a new subscription. And that's what I did about uh, uh, six, seven years ago. Um, but you're right. You have to get into their network, you have to buy a phone that only works on their network, right? And then you, or a satellite receiver, and then you uh, have to get a buy time on it for that period in which you want to use it. Um, so it's it's kind of an ancient, you know, old school <laughs> approach to cell service. But, you know, I've been eyeing that uh, Elon Musk and his, uh, what's it called, Starlink or something uh, service. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm hoping he'll include uh, Africa and Madagascar in it because that'll that'll revolutionize it. Um, right, and that's but that's mostly data uh, rather than voice. If I might, well, if you get data, you get voice. So it'll, okay, it'll be fine.
You also mentioned in terms of your kind of toolkit for these expeditions, um, a Toyota um, Land Cruiser. Um, my understanding was Toyota was sort of like the, I mean, throughout Africa, Toyota in general was the default vehicle. Is this a particular version of Toyota that you recommend above others? Yes. And I can say that um, most of the work we've done in Madagascar would not have been possible without this vehicle. And, and if you get into the, if, if you start hearing like this is a four by four, you kind of in your mind think of like Jeep or something like that, right? So that's a vehicle that can kind of get through something. But this vehicle, think of more of it as the uh, Red Cross uh, kind of hospital vehicle that you see with the big cross on it in, in a war zone or something. Um, that's what it is. So it fits 13 people. That means a lot of equipment. And it's got a, a kind of a truck level engine in it that has a lot of power and it never fails. They basically haven't changed the vehicle for 30 years or more, actually. I mean, you buy one right now, it looks exactly like the one I bought 30 years ago. Um, and it's very simple, like no, no electronics. And it's just super powerful. And that means what's so incredible about it, we've learned that it can do an amazing things. For example, um, in Madagascar, we collect insects in the rainy season when it's the most abundant of insects. But that also means in Madagascar, you spend all your time uh, crossing rivers. And in the beginning, we were like, oh, only go as deep as your snorkel, right? But then we, we found would describe out what, what a snorkel is. A snorkel is where you, you can get air into the, the carburetor, uh, or not carburetor, but right. air into the engine uh, for ignition. So there's, um, a pipe, there's a pipe sticking out of the hood right. of the engine way above the roof because – the engine needs air, and so you're going to suck the air through your snorkel like, like you were snorkeling for the engine. So the engine is actually going to get the air from above, right? Correct. And so you used to say you could <laughs> – the river had to be shallower than the height of your car. Right. And, and then we realized that that's not the case. These, these vehicles um, – and, you know – we also have a very different mentality. Like we're not like, oh, let's go out for a little drive today. No, we want to get to the forest, and and then often we want to get home. You know, uh, after the forest. So it's not like, <laughs> oh, let's let's wait a week and try this again. So we're just are going to go no matter what. And often we get to. Uh, I remember one time we only in ten days went eighty kilometers. In 10 days, we could see where we camped the night before from where we're camping tonight. And because you were so it, was just, it was so slow because of the mud? The mud and the water. It was a cyclone that went through and everything was inundated. It was right in the middle of Madagascar. And, and in those, you know, you, you start experimenting and you realize that um, it can do amazing things. And we found out that... And also it's because it's Madagascar and the people in Madagascar are, are really still have this team approach to everything. So often we get into a problem like, oh my gosh, we have this river we got to cross that's a kilometer wide. Uh, let's see if there's a village nearby. We go in the village and we say, hey, we need um, some help. We need to find a leader. And I want you to now get you know 20 people to help. And we're going to go and, and get this. And basically we figured out that these vehicles basically float. and you can actually drive them into the river, turn off the engine. And if you have, we have these straps now that go on each side of the car and people can kind of swim down on each side of the car and in front, just steering it as it kind of floats down. It's like a little boat or a barge or a ferry. It is. And as long as the engine's off, it's great. And now the problem is you're floating down river, you get to the other side. And of course you're at the other side of the river at, you know, not at a road, right? And why you need like 20 people is to help you build a path back to the road, you know, and get up the bank often, which is very, very difficult and over there. And in fact, always the vehicle just turns on afterwards. You know, one time we did think we actually completely ruined it. We didn't realize this, that our, our second tank, um, a reservoir, uh, was hit you and it separated pet from the main fuel. Tank. The petrol tank, you mean? The petrol, yeah, the uh, yeah. petrol tank. It, it um it separated from the fuel line. So the fuel line is dangling. And we go into this river that is really huge, but not very deep. And right in the middle of it, 
we have no power. The car just stops. And I'm like, what is going on? And we look, and of course, there's there's water everywhere in the engine, like everywhere. We're like, oh well, God. this is it, man. What are we going to do? And we notice that there's like dark skies in the mountains and the river is rising. We're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And we go to a village and they said, hey, you know, there's a an American living nearby here. Um, only 25 kilometers away if you walk down here. And he's running, a, he's in charge of a shrimp farm that just got built on the coast. So even though we've been kind of up already for 14 hours or, or so, and we, I started walking, we walked and part of the way we got a charrette ride with oxen and we, 25 kilometers later, I arrive at this uh, shrimp farm and they're in full panic. They're all running around like crazy. Their water system stopped working. All the shrimp are dying. And they, there's this uh, person in charge, actually from France. He said, go away. We can't handle anything. And I said, really? Well, I need your help too. And, and this guy comes out and said, I hear an American voice. It's this Texan. And he goes, he goes, he goes, what do you need? And I go, we, we need a tractor. We need 50 gallons of fuel. And he goes, fine, take it. And it was great. Wow. And um, of course, we didn't realize that we'd have to actually build the the path we took to be larger to get the tractor down there. But we went to the vehicle, pulled it out of the water, and I stuck the vehicle in gear. And as we towed it back over those 25 kilometers, just at the end, smoke started coming out and the engine started up and off we went. So these vehicles oh are God. magic. <laughs> That's the best recommendation for a vehicle I've ever heard. It's so never done. We still have it today. This is a Land Cruiser. Is that Toyota Land Cruiser? Well, so it's confusing, right? Because of this, I don't know how car companies do it. it. Somebody in the car business will have to explain it to me one day. But with everything that I'm using, you can't buy in the States, unfortunately. Um, so they only sell like the consumer versions of the, uh, the thing. So this whole brand, this whole kind of uh series is not available it's called the 70 series and the 13 passenger i think it's 78 it's um it's their they probably don't have seat belt. they probably don't have seat belts for the 13 people in the back they do <laughs> oh okay <laughs> you know, i think they do <laughs> no but there's a i don't know why they can't sell it but you these are it's a beautiful vehicle and it's you know, it's all steel underneath, like the ones you buy in the States, it's all plastic underneath, right? They're they're like the, the baby versions of 4x4. Um, it, it has none of the characteristics that we require um, to, to to allow us to, to do our job, uh, which is in the rainy season and through anything possible uh, to get it to get it through. Cool. Brian, this is really fantastic. We, we we have a couple more minutes. Do you want to talk about something, um, a project that you are working on, something you want to share with the audience? I, I know that you've been working with um, eating insects as a means of um, helping the environment. Is there, do you have something else beyond that that you want to mention? Well, well I want to mention that because I think it's it's, it's it's a great solution for a very wicked problem. And as Can you an summarize it in a few minutes, or, or, or is there a place you want to point to people? Um, yes, I can um, point them to uh, ipsio.org site on our Valala Farm uh, webpage that describes how we're using insects, um, that tradition of edible insects, and to use that to really add technology to bring it bring that solution to the masses. It solves the issue of nutrition. It reduces bushmeat consumption. It improves student learning at schools. It helps in health clinics. It improves livelihoods. And we're using the, the waste of it to improve regenerative forestation uh, in Madagascar. So the idea is, is that you raise insects as, as a form of protein instead of like, you know, mammals or basically, yes. right? Yeah. It's a much more efficient converter. Um, we've actually done the research to find out what insects that were traditionally eaten, what they preferred, what they valued, understood their recipes, and we figured out their limitations was just seasonal availability. So we've learned and done the science to figure out how to rear them in kind of a factory setting, in a sense, um, it's, and, and to upscale that such that we could, you know, given the chance, 
eliminate malnutrition in Madagascar, which impacts over 53% of the children in the country. Wow. And um, what is the sort of preferred insect, or do you have like a blend of insects for um, that, that you're kind of using right now for protein? Well, well, there's two. One is called the bacon bug, which is, um, we haven't figured out how to mass produce that at huge scales yet, but it's the preferred one and we can do it at small scales and people love it. And, and that's and, preferred in terms of taste and- Taste nutrition. and they can sell it for lots of money because everybody loves it. But we have um, the kind of more of a staple called, uh, it's a cricket. We produce a cricket powder. And the advantage there is that once it's ground up, it's stable. We can ship it all over Madagascar. And it's being used in school lunch programs. It's being used um, in, for famine relief. It's being used in health clinics like tuberculosis clinics. And we're actually taking the byproduct, the, the, the manure, as a fertilizer to actually restore landscapes and you know, improve the livelihoods where people are living. They can't keep cutting down the forest forever. There's almost none left. So that's called IPSIO? Ipsio? Ipsio, yeah. Okay. We'll have a link for that um, in the show notes. That's for uh, insects and people of the Southwest Indian Ocean. Okay. All right. Can you buy, um, if someone here in the States wanted to try some of this Bacon bug, is there an outlet for that here? No, there's no outlet for bacon bugs. We have a permit to sell it in Madagascar, but not overseas. But you can buy cricket protein. Right. Um, there's a company, Somehow cricket Intimo protein Farms. Doesn't, doesn't sound as exciting to me as bacon bug. I have to oh tell you. Oh, my God. Bacon <laughs> bugs is great. I would like to try bacon bug. One um, day. Stay okay. tuned. Okay. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> You know, thanks to um, supporters in the Bay Area of San, near San Francisco, we're now building our large new farm in Madagascar that will allow us to do the research needed for these types of uh, discoveries. Okay. Yeah. So more information at Ipsio um, for for how you can support the um, this program. Brian, thank you so much. And um, I always look forward to your Indiana Jones <laughs> stories. I wanted to hear about the ones where you were – having to get onto the plane in Central Africa and your adventures there. Um, but um, where can people go more for to follow you? You can uh, follow on Twitter, I guess, uh, okay. Ant Explorer. All right, Ant Explorer. And my research uh, lab at fisherlab.org. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Hey, everybody. It's Mark from the Cool Tools podcast. I want to thank you for being a listener to Cool Tools. And I also would like to let you know about our Patreon page. If you would like to support the Cool Tools show, as well as our video channel, the website, and all the newsletters that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash cool tools, that's just one word, cool tools, and pledge any amount you want. You could even pledge a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. We have editors, we pay for transcribing costs, we pay our reviewers, Every bit of money that you contribute goes towards supporting the show. I'd like to give a shout out to our supporters of the Cool Tools podcast. This week, I'd like to thank the following Patreon supporters. Bill Schuler, Bob Kay, Ryan Pelly, Carl D. Patterson, Chad Cosby, Chris Wheland, Chris Weirstook, Craig Tooker, Dan O'Brien, Dean Putney, Donnell Cunningham, Evan Barker, Graham Medlin, Hans Riesbeck, Helen Hegedus, Jerry Kearns, Jim Lesko, Jim Spofford, John Pollock, John Burdenbaugh, Keith O, Ken Altman, Les Howard, Lauren Bast, Mock Nerd, Malton Make, Mark Goebel, Matt Gromes, Michael Douglas, Michael Jones, and Michael Pecorini. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Cool Tools Show. We really appreciate it. Thank you.